<laughs> well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's really great to be back with you again after a week away. And I'm really delighted to be able to be preaching to you in this series on current issues and the Bible. Well, I hope you had a meaningful time from my friend Wei Hao last week as he shared with us about the different generations. And I hope his insights will help us to grow in unity as one church, recognizing that unity takes empathy, understanding, and in fact, a lot of hard work between the generations. Now, for this week in our series, I will be speaking on one of the most important topics for our generation, a truly existential issue confronting mankind, and that is the issue of creation care. So let us go now to the Lord to, in prayer to prepare ourselves properly. Let us pray. Lord, as we come to your word now, open your scriptures to us, even as we open our hearts to you to be shaped in obedience. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In recent years, the British environmentalist group Just Stop Oil has become notorious for their provocative, shall I say, advocacy, uh, advocacy tactics. Whether it is spray painting the exterior of buildings, or super gluing their hands onto famous paintings, or even walking onto the track during an F1 race, the list of their approaches to bring attention to environmental causes goes on. But perhaps the most infamous of these advocacy approaches has been their attempts to block traffic on roads to draw attention to their cause. Now, these blockades usually succeed, as you might imagine, in drawing attention, but also a lot of irritation. Because many ordinary people just trying to get on with their journey uh, get caught up in these roadblocks, and I think uh, you will be able to sympathize with the commuters. Uh, can you imagine how you would feel if you were just trying to get to work and then the road gets completely blocked by protesters? Now, my, my point here is neither to support nor to decry this group, but rather I think that the mental image of a roadblock is actually a helpful illustration for how Christians sometimes think about caring for God's creation. This roadblock is a metaphor for how Christians think about creation care. You see, sometimes we are like commuters. We see ourselves as busy Christians, just trying to get on with our busy lives, just trying to do what is the best for our faith and for our church. But then you have these guys who come in and they advocate for creation care, pushing for their cause. And it sometimes seems like a roadblock. After all, isn't the church supposed to focus on sharing the gospel, on discipleship, on missions? If so, isn't creation care just a roadblock on our journey to fulfill God's purposes? Isn't creation care just getting in the way of the church's mission? After all, what does creation care have to do with the church? Or to put it simply, why should we care about creation care? Why should we care about creation care? Now, there are many answers to this question. And the obvious answer, perhaps, is just simply pragmatism. Pragmatism. This is the answer that we give to Singaporeans. We need to care about creation care because we are currently suffering from an environmental crisis of monumental proportions. We know this from the mountains of well-validated scientific data offered up by researchers all around the world. And just a couple of days ago, perhaps you might have seen that the BBC reported that 2023 is on track to be the hottest year ever since humanity first kept records on temperature. Now, of course, this scientific data is also complemented in fact, by our own personal experience of rising temperature and pollution. In fact, here in Singapore, we cannot help but be reminded of this on a regular basis through the haze. 
the haze that is created by slash and burn agriculture and destructive peatland fires in our neighbouring countries. Because truly the environmental crisis does not respect borders. And so whether Christians are interested or not in creation care, we are still forced to reckon with the global impact of the present environmental crisis. So just for practical reasons, we must care about creation care. But beyond the pragmatic, there are also very important biblical reasons for why we should care about creation care. Now, one of those reasons is simply stewardship. Stewardship. We are taught in the opening chapters of the book of Genesis that all of creation was created by God and that humanity was created to steward creation. The words used in Genesis is to work and to keep it, as the Bible says in Genesis 2.15, to work and to keep it. And so Christians ought to care for God's creation regardless of whether there is an environmental crisis or not. Because creation care is a duty that God created us to do. We might even say that in the Christian worldview, creation care is an essential part of being human. It's what God created us to do. Being human according to God means caring about creation care. Another reason provided by the Bible is love. Is love. We are called by God to love our neighbour, especially those who are poor and marginalised. And for those of us who live in a country such as ours, a developed first world country, we must not forget that the phenomena of climate change and environmental degradation has a much greater impact upon the last, the lost and the least. You can see that in the picture, for example. It is not we that have to live in such environments. And so, it is no coincidence that when the National Association of Evangelicals, a major American alliance representing millions of Christians, when the NAE released their landmark report on creation care last year, they entitled the report, Loving the Least of These, Addressing a Changing Environment. Loving the Least of These, Addressing a Changing Environment. Because... To Christians, creation care is not just about creation. It is a very human issue too. And so if we care for others, we must care for creation. And so as Christians called by Jesus to love others, we must care about creation care. But in addition to all these reasons, I would like to focus our attention today on another biblical reason. And this reason, this is the key thing I want to focus on today, it can be stated as follows. Creation care is not a distraction from the gospel. Um, can the slide slow down a little bit, if you don't mind? Thank you. It is not an interruption from discipleship. It is not a roadblock from God's mission. On the contrary, the renewal of creation is a core element of God's salvation plan. It's a core element of God's salvation plan. The renewal of creation is a key component of God's redemptive mission. And therefore, the church ought to care for creation as we seek to work out our salvation. So this is the key point for today. So please let me re-emphasize that again. Listen carefully. Since the renewal of creation is a key element, is a key component of God's salvation plan, we ought to care for creation as we work out our salvation. Or to put it in another way, creation care is a necessary expression of gospel living. Creation care is a necessary expression of Christian discipleship. I want to demonstrate this point to you today in two ways. First, during the sermon, I will show you this briefly from Romans chapter 8, verses 19 to 23. You heard it right just now. And then second, I will demonstrate this to you more fully during the SSO later. And during the SSO session, I will take you for a whole or Bible tour showing you how creation is a critical dimension of the good news of Jesus Christ. And so especially today, I want to strongly encourage the church to stay behind for the SSO. It will make a big difference in how you think about creation care. 
But just for now, let us turn to the text that is the focus of this sermon. So you could turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, verses 19 to 23. Romans chapter 8, verses 19 to 23. Now, these verses that you heard read just now are from a portion of Scripture that actually Christians love very much, Romans chapter 8. And from verses 12 to 30, Paul speaks about how all Christians are children of God. That's the broad context. All Christians are children of God. And because we are children of God, we are heirs to God's promise. We will inherit God's promises. You see, an incredible <coughs> consequence of being heirs is that we will be glorified. If we are heirs, we will be glorified. And if you pay attention to these verses, you will see that the key word in verses 12 to 30 is the word glory. We will receive this glory at the resurrection. We will receive this glory at the resurrection. We will be glorified with Jesus. In other words, this is the glory that we will receive in Jesus because of Jesus and along with Jesus. Right? Glory is the big idea here. However, you know, as attractive as being glorified ourselves is, right? Paul warns us that before we can be glorified with Jesus, we must first suffer in this life just as Jesus did. And because he knows we will suffer, he wants us to persevere through this suffering. He wants us to hold on to hope amid this suffering. And Paul tells us that we can hope because such suffering will pale in comparison with the incredible glory that we will be given when our bodies are redeemed, when we are given our resurrection bodies, when God remakes us and renews all Christians. And so I'm just trying to give you the big picture of the chapter, okay? And if we want to summarize the big picture of the chapter, we would say this, Christians should hope for resurrection glory despite suffering. That's the big picture. Christians should hope for resurrection glory despite our suffering. That's what we look forward to. Now, what does all of this have to do with creation care? You see, even as Paul is making this big argument, even as he's trying to inspire us to hope for resurrection glory, he is trying to give us an inspiration. He wants to point us to an example of persevering hope, something we can look to and imitate in the way that we hope. But you know what he points to? It's rather interesting. He doesn't point to a person. He points to creation. Creation is the example that he holds up. And so this is what our sermon text for today, verses 19 to 23, focuses on. Paul says this in verse 19. He says, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. So in the same way that Christians, we Christians are called to hope, we are told in this text that all creation is also eagerly longing, eagerly hoping, eagerly anticipating something. Now what is creation hoping for? It tells us, it's hoping for the revealing of the sons of God. Now, what does this interesting phrase mean? Actually, it's quite simple. It sounds very cheap, but it's actually quite simple. Paul is referring to the moment where God will reveal to us our resurrection bodies. Our resurrection. This is the moment where God will renew us at the resurrection. And how do we know this? We know this because of verse 23 later on, where Paul says this. We wait eagerly, we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Can you see? It's exactly, exactly the same language of eager waiting. In fact, the word in Greek is exactly the same. So it's the same language of hope that Paul has already mentioned in verse 19. And so verse 19 declares that all of creation, everything around you, is eagerly hoping for your resurrection. That is what Paul is saying. But why is this the case? Why does creation care about the resurrection? Verse 20, the next verse, tells us the problem for creation. Because creation was subjected to futility. So the text tells us that 
creation was subjected to a state of frustration, cursed to purposelessness. In other words, just like mankind, who was cursed at the fall, all creation was also cursed. So even as mankind fell in Genesis 3, creation, as you know, was also implicated in the fall. Creation also fell. And so you see, creation is part of the salvation story right from the very beginning of the Bible. Verse 21, the next verse, then tells us that creation eagerly longs. Creation eagerly longs in hope. See? In hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Thus, just as how creation was cursed to fallenness when mankind fell, creation is also looking forward to its own redemption when it will be set free from corruption, when it will obtain the freedom, freedom from its curse. But actually, if you pay attention to this verse, you will notice that freedom is described in a very interesting way in this verse. You see, the freedom that creation will receive is not the freedom of creation itself. It's the freedom of the glory of the children of God. In other words, the creation that, the character, sorry, the character of the redemption that creation will receive is of the same nature of the freedom that we will receive. It's the same thing. So just as we will be resurrected and renewed, creation will also be renewed in the same way. This is then why verse 22 describes the current experience of creation as groaning together in the pains of childbirth. You see, creation is awaiting a new birth. Or perhaps to put it in language that you're more familiar with, creation is waiting to be born again. To be born again. Just as Christians are described as being born again. So you can see that Paul intimately links the hope that creation has to hope for mankind. The redemption story of creation and humanity, this is intricately linked. You cannot separate it apart. Creation is an essential part of the gospel story. The gospel is not just about us. And this is why in the final verse for today, verse 23, we are taught something very interesting. Paul writes in verse 23, not only the creation, but we, we ourselves, we have the first fruits of the Spirit. And so we also groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So notice what we are, we are called. We are called those who have the first fruits. Right? Those of you who have the first fruits, they are also the second fruits, the third fruits, the, the fruits that will come later on. Right? But we, humanity, we are the first fruits. What does this imply? In other words, we are the first to be redeemed in God's order of salvation. We are redeemed first and then creation. In other words, creation is lining up behind us in the queue for renewal. We go first, but then creation will also be redeemed. Both will be redeemed. Both are in the queue. This is why creation eagerly awaits our redemption. I think you understand this. Lah. You know what it feels like to be queuing behind someone. You're waiting for them to have their turn so that you can have your turn. This is exactly what Paul is saying here in the text. So to summarize, in this passage, Paul makes clear that the relationship between humanity and creation is very tight. So first of all, it is not, listen carefully, it's not that humanity will be redeemed, but creation will be simply left to burn up and to be thrown away. That is a view that undervalues creation. And neither is it the case that humanity will be redeemed in exactly the same way as creation, so that neither is distinguishable for one another. That will be undervaluing humanity. Instead, humanity and creation are inextricably linked in the salvation story, but humanity as the stewards of creation leads the way in the order of salvation. So humanity first, 
and then creation. Okay, let me, this is quite um, um, theological. So let me summarize this to help us along, okay? So just recall in Romans chapter 8, Paul again is trying to encourage Christians to hope for resurrection glory despite our suffering. That's what we said at the start. And so to justify his argument in our passage for today, Paul then points to creation, right? He says he wants to set up creation as an example. So he says, hey, hey Christians, in the midst of your suffering, as you struggle with hope, look to creation for inspiration. Do you realise just now when we were reading all the verses at the start, God keeps on using scripture to tell us to look at creation, to, to see what creation is doing in praising, whether it's in Job or in the Psalms. He keeps on telling us to look at creation. He's telling us to do the same thing here. Look to creation for inspiration. Like you, creation is also broken and fallen. Like you, creation is also suffering. Creation is also groaning in the pains of childbirth. But you know what? Despite its suffering, creation is still eagerly hoping, eagerly waiting, eagerly anticipating your resurrection. But because creation knows that you will be renewed in the resurrection, it too will be renewed in the resurrection. When you receive your resurrection glory, creation will also obtain the very same freedom of the glory of the children of God. It's the same. So Christians, what should you do according to Paul? Hold on to your hope despite your suffering and look to creation as a model of hope. Okay? So for the last 10 minutes or so, I'm just trying to spell out and make clear the argument of Romans. As you know, Romans are a little bit tough. So we're trying to just make sure the argument is clear for you to understand. But now, even as Paul makes this argument in Romans, what is especially important for us to recognize for the purpose of our sermon today is that creation and humanity, as I said many times, are both inextricably linked in the salvation story. So God's salvation story involves the renewal of both, of both. It is not just about us. And so this is the reason that I spoke about just now. This is the reason why we ought to care for creation care. Because the renewal of creation is a key component of God's salvation plan. And therefore, as we work out our salvation, we ought to care for creation. It is not something separate from the gospel story. It is part of the gospel story. Creation care must be an expression of gospel living, of Christian discipleship. This is the key theological point for today. Now, some of you may be thinking this in your heads. Hey, uh, Pastor, haven't I learned, uh, haven't I been taught that the current heavens and earth will be burnt up and destroyed before being remade at the coming of Jesus? If the world is going to be burnt up, why is there a need to take care of the present creation? Well, friends, unfortunately, I just, I just, I'll just be plain here. Uh, there's a piece of wrong theology that some of us have received, especially if we have read the King James Version of 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. Let me just put it up on the screen. This is the KJV, and in KJV, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 reads this, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. And this is the part that people stumble over. And the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. Right? So you read something like this and you think to yourself, hey, there the, the text says clearly the earth will be destroyed. Now, the problem is that some of you who are familiar with the KJV will know that the KJV is based on a very limited set of Bible manuscripts. And by and by, scholars have analysed the much more, we have much more manuscripts right now because we have discovered much more manuscripts right now. And we have recognised that this manuscript, this particular manuscript, is inaccurate. It's because over time, as you transmit manuscripts down the years, errors creep in. And scholars have developed ways to check manuscripts against one another to discover which are the ones that are correct and which are the ones that are incorrect. 
And so the best scholarship now recognizes that 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 should be translated differently. And uh, thank God the better translation is reflected in the ESV, the version that we use in our church. Let me read this verse again. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burnt up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Not burnt up, exposed. It's a different Greek word. So it's not that the earth will be burnt up. What will happen is that the heavens that cover the earth will be burnt up. And then the earth will be exposed to the gaze of God from above. And so, in other words, this is a portrait of God being able to judge the works of humanity at the day of Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. This is a portrait of God judging the works of humanity at the day of Jesus Christ. But after this judgment, just as humans will not be thrown away or burnt up, but rather we will be renewed, in the same way creation will also be renewed, refreshed and recycled. Or actually, if you uh, think more theologically, we'll, creation will actually be upcycled because it will become a new and better creation. Okay? So I want to address this uh, common theological error that arises because of translational issues. Okay. We have talked a lot, a lot about how the renewal of creation is a key component of God's salvation plan. And because of that, we ought to care for creation as we work out our salvation. And this is the key point of our sermon today. So this has implications for how we should live. We need to start applying this to our lives at both the individual as well as the church level. And I want to dedicate the rest of the sermon to practical application. Uh, but don't worry, I won't be going into too much detail today. Uh, we will take more time next year, in fact, to unpack this more fully. So let's start with at the individual level first. And for the individual level, there are three things I would like to commend to you today. First of all, as you start on your personal creation care journey, start by simply developing an awareness, an awareness of your impact of the impact of your actions as an individual on creation. You need to kind of wake up to what's happening around you. Start today by doing that. For example, I'll give you one very simple thing, okay? Consider this. Let's say you go to McDonald's, you go to Shake Shack, or you're more Asian, you go to Jollibee. How much waste is created by each visit? Just think about it. How much waste is created by your one visit to McDonald's. You order a Big Mac, the disposable wrapper. You order fries, the container. You order a drink, the cup, the cover. It's not just the straw. Straw is a distraction. The tray liner, the sauce packet, the sauce dish. Now they don't have packet, they always give you the dish instead, but it's still the same amount of waste. And if you have dessert, the packaging around your ice cream sundae, your apple pie. The list actually goes on and on and on. How much do you have to dump into the dustbin at the end of the meal? You see, until you think about it, you don't realise just how much waste we create in modern living. And so we need to start to sensitise ourselves to our own impact in the world around us. Because when you have awareness, that is when you start to change yourself. The, first, I, I, the journey that I just took you through for uh, McDonald's, I went through myself. I, I like McDonald's. And so now, whenever I go to work, some of you may have noticed, I always carry a bag around with me to work when I come to work in the morning. And that bag, basically, car what I do is I'm carrying reusable containers. So if, even if I go to a hawker centre to tapau food, I'm using those containers instead because there's no need to generate that kind of waste if it's not needed. So just start simply today by having awareness of your own impact on the environment. Second of all, I want to again address something that's maybe in your hearts, which is that creation care is not the same as secular environmentalism. Creation care is not the same as just stop oil. Okay, We're not on the same side, so to speak. Secular environmentalism approaches the issue from a very different basis than from Christian creation care. 
You see, for example, some environmentalists assume that we are one with creation. And that's why we should care for creation, according to them. But this is a very unbiblical worldview. We're not part of creation, one with it. That's, that worldview is called pantheism. Others assume that we are exactly of the same value, equal nature with the rest of creation. And because of that, we should care. That is also an unbiblical worldview. Because our worldview is different from theirs, we should not follow their practices. Okay? Instead, because God made us stewards of His creation, we are given permission to utilize creation for the welfare of our fellow human beings. It's not that we can't touch creation. But what we are called to do is to honor the Creator and honor His purposes for creation as we utilize and steward creation. It's a dynamic relationship that we have. Okay, third of all, just simply as a simple practical application, can I strongly encourage you once again to join us for the SSO later? Because in this sermon, I can tell you I've barely scratched the surface of what the Bible has to say. I, I, I've gone through, what, four verses. But what I will do so later in the SSO is I'm going to take you on a tour through the whole Bible. I'm going to show you a, what we call a biblical theology of creation care. How does it tie into the gospel story? So can I please encourage you to join us for the SSO later? It will give you not just a fresh perspective on creation care, I hope it will give you a fresh perspective on the gospel as well. So all are welcome. Okay, so we talked a little bit about individuals. Let me turn our attention now to the church. Uh, and here I also have three points for the church, okay? First of all, I, I want us to know as a church that creation care is a journey. It's a journey for all churches. So we're not going to wake up next Sunday and suddenly the church will be transformed into a creation care church. Uh, life doesn't work like that. You wish, but it doesn't work like that. And just like how churches take time to mature and deepen their faith, it also takes time to grow in creation care. It's not something that happens overnight. And just as an example, I want to, um, for us to even consider one of the ministries that we have in Bethany, our gardening ministry. Our gardening ministry. Now, those of you who know about our gardening ministry know that they started small with some of the existing plots in our church and just a few of our church members. And you may have noticed that over the years, the church has, in fact, grown more beautiful. And maybe some of you have enjoyed some of the papaya, uh, the bananas, and all the other produce from the church. And if you are familiar, they come every Tuesday and Saturday, and they have put in so much time and effort, and even some of their own resources. You may have seen the banner outside. Bethany didn't pay for that banner. The volunteers paid for that banner themselves. Right. So that's slowly growing. But then the gardening ministry started small, then they started to expand the ministry. How did they do that? They started to invite church members to contribute in their own way. So some of you maybe don't have the time to come down to garden. So what have they done? They have invited church members to contribute food waste for composting. Right? Your food waste for composting. So I see quite a, a number of you on Sundays, you will dutifully bring your food waste to put in the composting area for that purpose. And in that way, the gardening ministry helps us to practice our faith even if we don't necessarily have the time to join them on the Tuesdays and Saturdays. But they didn't stop that because after doing that stuff, the ministry then turned our garden into a community garden, inviting even our neighbours, inviting people who are not Christians into our church to be part of the team, thus giving us a precious opportunity to bless our neighbours and to get to know them. In fact, I'm so heartened that after discussing with uh, Bernard, who leads the gardening team, the gardening team, uh, the gardening ministry is in fact planning to lead Bethany in more community outreach activities next year. So even those of us who are not gardening, know nothing about gardening, can help to reach out to our neighbours and love them through the ministry. You see, in this way, creation care is a journey of growth for every church. I'm going to embarrass you all a little bit, sorry, but could I invite the creation, uh, the, the, the gardening team to stand just so that people know who you are? Sorry, I embarrass you, Maggie, don't mind. <laughs> Bernard. <laughs> Kishong. Kishong over there. Uh, this is not just the whole team, uh, there's quite a big team. Yeah, thank you, thank you for coming. Come inside there, also, right? 
Yeah, thank you very much for your service to the church and how you just make sure we have a more and more beautiful environment to worship in. So creation care is a journey, first thing, and we will journey together. Second, secondly, I want to help us to see the end of the journey, a vision for the journey. And I want to give you an example of a church in Singapore that is further along on the creation care journey. And this is Katong Presbyterian Church, seven minutes away from Bethany if you are driving uh, on the Ceylon Road side. Uh, this is a church that I, I know their leaders quite well. And they have incorporated creation care as one of their church's core values. In fact, I want to read the, their value statement for us to hear. This is their value statement. Value number five, caretakers of the earth. Each new generation of Christians should do their best to make the earth a better place than when they first received it from the previous generation. This would involve active restoration and lifestyle sacrifices in our generation so that the next generation may inherit a healthier planet. You see what I'm saying here? They recognize that caring for creation also means caring for people. The two things come together. Now, of course, their emphasis on creation care isn't just on a piece of paper that they file away or put on their church website so that the, the church looks nice. In fact, it's very much incorporated into the daily life of the church, even their church building as well. So, for example, they recently went through a church building renewal, and rather than throw away their pews, they upcycled all their pews into office furniture. So every single piece of furniture that you see, all the tables, these are all pews. And this is not the only place in the church that has this. Another example is how they use reusable crockery and cutlery in their church whenever they have church events, and they integrate easy-to-use wash-up points for all their events so that they can minimize disposable waste. A third example is how they integrate greenery and natural cooling architecture into the design of their church to minimize air conditioner use. Nice, right? It's a beautiful space, very, very cool, even in the heat of the day. You see, the list goes on. For them, it's not just something you do to receive a sticker on your chest. It's something that they integrate into the lifestyle of the church as a way to live out creation care in their discipleship journey. Now, I'm showing you these pictures not so that we can copy them. We need to be mindful of Bethany's history and our own context. In fact, there's so much to be you know, thankful for in our own church. We are a church in a garden. You realize that? We are a church in a garden. And we can build on that in our own way. Now, speaking of our own context, thirdly, I want you to know that Bethany will be undergoing a creation care journey from next year onwards as part of our ongoing focus on discipleship. After a lot of discussion with Pastor Desmond, we have decided to integrate creation care as part of our discipleship approach for our church, one dimension of the discipleship approach for our church. And we will slowly implement changes that will help us to steward God's creation better. At this point, the pastoral team would like to give you three, uh, a short preview, actually, of three exciting events that will be taking place next year. First of all, on 22nd of May 2024, on Visak Day, um, please mark it down your calendars, Bethany will be organising a creation care community event where we will be inviting our neighbours from around us to come and join us for a day of events focused on creation care. We expect, for example, to have a gardening workshop, uh, a nature-based art class, and for families, storytelling for children, and even a workshop on bugs for children, where children can play with bugs. Moreover, we do not expect this to be a once-off event. We are planning for some of these workshops to then carry on into the June holidays so that we have multiple touch points with our visitors. We hope that you will actively support this event, both in preparation and on the day itself. So this is a way that we serve the community through creation care. That's the first thing. Second of all, as I mentioned, the pastoral team is convinced that creation care should be a part of our discipleship approach. And so we are hoping to renew, sorry, to review the way that we do things in Bethany and improve 
So we are going to partner with a local Christian group called Creation Care Singapore to organize a Creation Care Hackathon. Uh, this is not a coding hackathon. Uh, we will not be sitting in front of computers. It's a social hackathon where we will be inviting young adults from around Singapore, who, from the various churches, to form teams to help Bethany brainstorm ways to integrate creation care as part of our church life. Now, this will take place on 18 and 19 uh, May, the weekend before our own creation care community event. It's meant to come as a package. Third of all, our church has in recent years, as you know, uh, become known for our teaching ministry, and we want to continue to emphasize this. So next year, we'll be organizing our inaugural Bible conference on the theme of creation care. The date here is not confirmed yet, but it's likely to be quarter three or quarter four of 2024. So friends, as you can see from all these events, the pastoral team is planning to focus on creation care as part of our initiative to drive discipleship. That has always been the big thing for us since this year. We are planning to incorporate this as part of discipleship in a way that is meaningful, organic, and supportive of our other priorities. So we hope you will give us the strongest support in this initiative. So friends, I've gone on long enough. In conclusion, we started today's sermon by asking the question, why should we care about creation care? We heard many reasons, whether it's pragmatism, stewardship, or love, but then we spend most of our time on this reason, that the renewal of creation is a key component of God's salvation plan. And therefore, we ought to care for creation as we work out our salvation. And so let us do this in our personal lives and as Christians, since it's a necessary expression of gospel living. And let us take this journey together. Let us pray. Father, as we have sung this morning, you are the maker of heaven and earth. And so even as we care for creation, we care and obey you. As we as a church take this journey together, Lord, we ask that you continue to guide us with your wisdom. In all humility, help us to love you and learn new ways of being disciples in this church. Help us to move past any uh, older mindsets, Help us to renew our thinking about what discipleship will look like for today so that we might minister more effectively to a hurting and broken world. Thank you, Lord, for being with us. And may we serve you in all faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.